Hi, I'm Travis Holcomb, and you're listening to Morning Becomes Eclectic, and I am here with Bradford Cox, lead man of Deer Hunter. Thank you so much for that session. I wouldn't really, I wouldn't no. really want to be called a lead man. What would you like to be called? Just um, an agent. An agent of Deer Hunter. Yeah. Well, welcome and thank you for doing Thanks. that session. It sounded incredible. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad that, um, you know, there's some radio stations out there that would still allow us to just uh, do what we can do within the constraints of time and uh, explore the room we're in and stuff like that as opposed to carbon copying our album for uh, some kind of promotional scheme. Well, speaking of the new album, it's called Fading Frontier. And I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what that means, Fading Frontier. Well, it's good. it means whatever it, it means to the audience. You know, when they look at the image on the cover by John Davola, who's here, a, a California artist uh, who took that photograph uh, at Point Zuma in, uh, I think, 1978, maybe mid-70s. I don't want to be incorrect there, but... Uh, you know, I think if you look at that picture, it's gonna, it's, and you you read the title, "Fading Frontier," you're gonna have some kind of idea of what uh, what is being said. But it is sort of up to you to sort of um, fully uh, fill it out. You know, Ooh. to me, my personal take. I mean, you know, it's not that I feel like my artistic or uh, creative interests are fading or the my ability to improvise with my group um or uh other artists or visually uh graphically film things of that nature but i feel that um culture and not, I'm, not, I'm not just blaming uh industries that that propagate culture but but culture itself is fading a bit tastes uh are being engineered um, everything is content, everything is editorial, everything is this, this design to push you one way or another. And, uh, you know, I just don't feel that, uh, I feel very, um, I feel very diminished by that, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, do you feel like that's more prevalent now or just under the magnifying glass just because well, of Well, I think that outlets? when you remove, uh, the blanket of of um of let's say um okay for example like a record label like virgin they saw they would sign royal trucks mm -hmm. and why did they sign royal trucks and in 1992 or 93 you know for like a, a million plus dollars allegedly right why did they do that very clearly they did it and they they said as much as far as i know i think it's you know something you could you could uh credit uh you could source the the quote but it's some you know it was during a rush where everybody wanted to find the next nirvana uh they saw money in it they saw content advertising uh you know they saw they saw a big empire mm -hmm. and sometimes in order to attract that sort of creative talent you have to lure them in with bait. And so they said, who's the most, uh, you know, esoteric band we could sign to lure these people in? And Royal Trucks, of course, have this very, like, I, I wasn't alive. Well, I was alive. I wasn't around. I'm not trying to act like I'm an expert. But, you know, I, I was thinking about Royal Trucks a lot lately. Uh, and, you know, they just reunited. And I was thinking about that, 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 that kind of thing. What I'm getting at here is that in the past, corporations like uh, Virgin, major labels, would sign bands. And so you would get these accidental avant-garde kind of things leaking into the, the, the mainstream media, mm -hmm. okay? Well, now that the corporate music industry is pretty much on a breathing machine, paid for by like, you know, other corporations who need it for credibility, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like Time Warner kind of bullshit. Excuse the language. Yeah, you know, basically now that 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 the music industry, including the independents, are on a breathing machine, so-called independents. Uh, there's not really a great way of sneaking, uh, you know, a paint bomb into the Louvre. You know what is that? What's the Paris? the Louvre yeah yeah you know can't really it's hard to sneak in like a stink bomb into the into the 
to the uh, pep rally, you know? Right. And so I just feel like, you know, things like Royal Trucks, Sonic Youth, uh, a lot of bands when I was 11, 10, 11, 12 years old, they had a big influence on me. And they made me think, I, you know, you don't have to have everything figured out in advance. You don't have to, you know, there was an improvisation in that music. Mm -hmm. I don't want to overplay it because a lot of those bands might argue with that. They might say, no, we weren't. Like, it's like, you know, Captain Beefheart and the Magic Band. If you said they were, it sounds improvisational, but they can replay every single note verbatim. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what I'm saying is it comes from a place that's not designed comfort, you know? Right. It's not like Ikea music. And, uh, you know, it's not, uh, you know, it's like Wabi Sabi, you know, the Japanese aesthetic of, of imperfection, you know, and uh, it's dangerous to uh, marketing executives unless they can commandeer it and um, capitalize on it. It's just something on my mind recently. You know, I'm, I don't, I'm not overly like, you know, People can call me a hypocrite. People can say, well, you're on a big label. You, you have all this money behind you. Well, you know, I never asked for anything. I never sent out a demo in my life. Never asked any label to pay attention to me. I never asked for any, do you, do I have the, do I look like I have the fucking face of somebody that would end up uh, asked to play your radio station or, you know what I mean? If you saw the 12 year old me, you wouldn't, you, you'd just be like, oh, I hope that kid doesn't like attempt conversation with me. <laughs> You know, I'm just saying, it's, it's just really, I never thought I had any kind of uh, future in this. It just happens. So when people say to me, but you have all these opportunities, you have, I didn't ask for any of them. And I'll tell you what I come from. I come from a very, very blue collar, middle class, unentitled background, um, you know, where the idea of playing music for an audience is thrilling. And it still to this day is. Mm -hmm. To have people care about what I'm doing is a lot more valuable to me than uh, what some promotional uh, record cycle paid for advertising scheme, you know, whatever. It's just the idea. All I want to do is make people happy, play, entertain them, you know, and maybe entertain them with something that's not necessarily funny or, or uplifting. Entertain them with uh, pathos. And I just think it's a lot of a lot of music these days is getting very formulaic uh but it's always been that way but there's always been an underground to challenge and it's it's like the the political system you know uh, you're taught in government class in eighth grade there's a system of checks and balances in the american government this is what we're taught mm -hmm. so that one thing can't overstep another and in the past there's always been a very vibrant underground and a very strong you could say uh dissonant minority to challenge the mainstream. Now that the mainstream is, you know, in critical care, I don't see anything rising to challenge. You know, it's like everybody is just uh, complacent and a lot of the underground music is becoming a, a, an imitation of the aesthetics that previously were the dominating force, the oppressive force, the 80s aesthetic. And I mean, okay, I'm sure you could say, well, your album has sort of an 80s aesthetic, that breezy, breezy, I keep hearing that word breezy, da 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 da. You know, I don't know. Maybe that's true, I, I could be hypocritical. But I feel like, I feel like, uh, you know, I was in improvisation. I've been reading uh, Concerning the Spiritual in Art by Kandinsky, the modernist. I guess he's a modernist artist, visual artist. He wrote a book. Really interesting. You know, and he talks about the only purpose of a great work of art. I mean or the only way a great work of art is, I, I don't want to paraphrase the quote. The, it blew me away when I read it. I urge the listeners to go out and try to find a copy. I think it's like, you know, the first paragraph of the book. It's such a great encapsulation of what, what it means to create something, you know, to contribute to the ever 
evolving continuum of music, art, books, culture, visual, you know. It's important. It's not a job, and it's not something that should be taken so lightly. Mm -hmm. It's not something, it's not a playlist, you know. Culture, culture is in danger right now. It's, it's streaming right into a void. You know what I mean? Everything is available all the time. It sounds like some biblical thing that, you know, you know, whether you're religious or not, that kind of uh, decadence is always met with some weird, terrible thing happening, like people turning into pillars of salt or something. You know, you can't have an entire history of music available to you all, at all times because the meaning and the context of each part of that music, why a Romanian composer from you know the 40s was very dangerous to the linear timeline of music. It becomes lost in the ether. It's just another thing on a playlist, you know? Something that changed the world is just another thing on a playlist, and it's got less hits than, than uh, you know, uh, What's the number one thing played on your station today? It's probably Disclosure. Disclosure is killing, you know, is killing Penderecki. Christoph Penderecki, hello? I don't know, I'm not familiar. Really? Uh, Messian, Oliver Messian? Mm -mm. Invented, you know, changed chromatic. But don't you feel like nowadays if you know now i will go check those that out and it's available and just as soon as i get back to my computer i can right. go and access it well the problem with that i think is this you're gonna access it and you're gonna say oh that's what that is yeah and it won't go beyond that maybe you look at the wikipedia page but data has become so free that it can only become cheap and by cheap i don't mean that it costs me something or you something to learn about what what the history of culture, but cheap because it means less to us. Mm -hmm. When I was young, and I'm, uh, I mean, I'm not old now, I guess, in technical terms, uh, but you know, when I was a young man, young boy, there was an incredible dangerous electricity to going to the library and digging through the discs, the vinyl, the books about 20th century music, you know? I went from liking Hole uh, to liking, uh, you know, to liking um, something like Sonic Youth, to liking, well, that's not really true. I like Sonic Youth before. I like, I'm, I'm trying to give an example of how somebody finds out about Sonic Youth. And then Sonic Youth, okay, back in those times, you would hear Kim Gordon t referring to, uh, you know, well, actually, uh, you'd hear her refer to like, you know, a lot of LA artists or, you know, you hear her refer to, I'd re I, I really like uh, admired and looked up to Kim Gordon. And uh, I always said, I don't want to grow up to be like Thurston Moore, you know, <laughs> whatever, you know, I don't want to be like him because I just sense something um, fetishistic about his, you know, he collects it all, you know? He has rooms and just, he has that record collector vibe, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And um, Kim Gordon seems like someone to me that appreciates each thing that they're listening to at the time. It's less about like appreciating a genre or collecting everything of that genre. It's more like, I like, of the Fluxists, I like Nam June Pack. You know, one, and I'm going to focus on that artist's work. I'm not going to refer to the Fluxus as a general collective and only, you know what I'm saying? There's two types of mindsets about obscure, uh, about underground art, you know? There's the, like, collectivist idea of, like, let's refer to the, to the brutalist movement in architecture. Let's refer to the, the serialists in music, you know? Let's refer to this. Or you can say, I'm just interested in this one guy you know or girl one Pauline Oliveros 
you know, I'm just interested in, or uh, in early electronic music, you know, you have Laurie Spiegel or, uh, you know, Daphne Oram, all these people, you know, and it's like, you want to get interested in early electronic music as a genre, or do you want to get into it because you find somebody that you're really interested in whose work speaks to you? I guess it all to me, it becomes a matter of, of are we getting, are, are we treating culture like a commodity that's curated by like a boutique culture? So, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Cottage stuff, you know? Or are we really giving it like, okay, this is somebody who's actually changing the way that we think about cinematography? Like Sven Nickvist, or, you know, or how, how do you, any of the cameramen in this room know who I'm talking about? God, I think are, it's Nike. Is this the thing about, about LA? Woody Allen's cinematographer, right? Uh, well, he was, he was, he was, he was Ingmar Bergman. Right, okay, yeah. And then he, you know, this is so funny because you know, like I grew up thinking when I was a little boy, I lived in little towns. At, uh, the biggest of which, to me, I guess in my memory, is Athens was a very cultural town. And uh, but you know, I lived in small towns, Greenville, Mississippi. Uh, I grew up, at, you know, I met Locke in Marietta, Georgia, and you know, I always thought someday I'll get to be big cities like L.A. and New York City, and they'll know the stuff I'm into. I can have a conversation about about a Swedish cinematographer, um, or uh, you know, sh sort of these things I got into through bands like Sonic Youth. So technically, through David Geffen, I found out about Charlemagne Palestine or you know, some obscure artist. Thanks, David Geffen. Want to just shout out to David Geffen. Uh, and um, you know, I'm saying it's like, uh, I always thought, you know, I'll come to LA, I'll come to New York, you know? And I'll, I'll meet all these people and they'll know what the fuck I'm talking about. They'll be interested in the same things I'm interested in. Maybe I'll find a romantic partner, a soulmate. You wanna know why I'm asexual? Why? Because I showed up in LA and New York and all the other LA's and New York's and Tokyo's and Paris's and London's of the world in my early 20s with a head full of ideas. And I didn't find that many people that... I found a lot of people playing dress up. A lot of people dressing up. They don't really give two SHITs mm -hmm. about... Uh, what the you know what this art what this visual art what this music what this literature what up they, they don't they appreciate the cover they appreciate the t-shirt i find it superficial and it made me depressed and i said i can't relate to this this you know i'm not saying i'm smarter than other people i'm not saying that i'm i'm just saying i have a hard time finding people to connect with part of that is probably because i'm viewed as a loud mouthed brat probably viewed as an annoying, cloying, self-congratulatory, arrogant person who probably thinks he's so smart about art and everything. Oh, but he plays really boring indie rock. You know, that's probably why. It's, it's confusing. I would, that would be a sad thing to hear me say if, if I actually gave a shit <laughs> what anybody thinks, you know. And I mean that like, uh, if I didn't believe that my that the music I was making was interesting to, 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 to the point of signing my name to it, you know? I'll ask a really interviewee interview question, but... I'm, I think you deserve to be able to do that. <laughs> you put up with my... Uh... No, but if you, weren't, if you weren't a musician, I mean, you've been in this band for 10 years now. And you oh, longer than that. It's, it's, it's really this, difficult but... for people to understand that Deer Hunter is, is like a stream. And it's it's been going on in different forms for a lot longer than ten years. It's um, I made the first cassette of my music in 1994. Um, I know that sounds precocious, and so obviously were... it's not on Discog, so I right. mean whatever. But it's just sort of like I mean the concept of like when people say, "Oh, you've been doing this for ten years," I'm like, "Huh," you know. Mm. Ten years ago, I was on tour with Liars you know, one of the greatest bands I've ever toured with. S continue with your question. I mean, that that was to me like the middle of Deer Hunter, you mm -hmm. know? That wasn't the early years. So that it was started like when you were roughly 12? Well, then? no, I mean, I started creating the the work that would become, Spring Hall Convert was written when I was 13 or 14 years old. 
the soft cryptograms. There are songs on uh, Fading Frontier that are probably from... I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a song there that was written in 1998 or 99. Or at least a guitar section or something, you know? But I do. I don't want to interrupt you. I want to. No, it's all right. No, but have you ever thought about what you would be doing in life? Absolutely. If you... I had a conversation with these guys filming us. I always did what I would be doing. I've I've worked. I got it. My first job at Wendy's when I was uh, 14 years old with a forged work consent paper, and um, that's on Wendy's, not on me. So <laughs> their legal department can handle that one. I grew up without in a family that did not have a lot of money. And we, we struggled. And so when I needed, when I was old enough, you know, I worked. Well, actually, before I was old enough. And I'm, I'm not trying to give some kind of, oh, I come from hard times bullshit. I'm just saying, I, fuck, I worked my life. I've always worked. And if this ended tomorrow, I would work. And what I did before, right before, uh, when Deer Hunters started, for years I worked. Uh, I was a graphic designer. But not in some kind of like arty way. I was I, I I designed graphics for like signs, mm -hmm. uh, open house Sunday, uh, visit our new location at such a you know vinyl signs. I cut them out. Uh, I did. I worked at a film lab doing color grading. Uh, I so you know I played I played music as a hobby. Um, and I think that that's where our, a lot of our success came from is if you treat something like it's going to make or break you, it will probably break you. Do you know how I always win poker games? How? I don't give a shit if I win or lose. You bet like that, you know? Aspiration and ambition aren't terrible qualities. Certainly some of the people that changed art that I was talking about. They were aspirational. They were ambitious. You know? It's not, you know... It's just, it's just when your aspiration and your ambition become the engine of what you're creating. That, to me, is a weakness, you know? That never... I was very lucky that that never happened. It is difficult to grow old in a world where music is truly asphyxiating on its own vomit and everybody seems fine with it and I'm not saying I do anything to correct the situation I'm not saying my music's great go buy my album the, the message of this interview is not now if you want something different if you want to see the new you know vote for me I'm not fuck, I'm not Bernie Sanders you know I'm not like trying to offer some impossible solution like you know buy my album and you're gonna hear some indie rock centrist indie rock hopefully somebody will hear me talking and say i don't like his music i like what he's saying i'm gonna go start a band there you have it bradford cox from deer hunter hey. on morning becomes eclectic become eclectic <laughs> make all your mornings eclectic